Um, so I'm up from Sunnybrook, um, so I put this image here as a helpful guide for those of you that have no clue where Sunnybrook <laughs> is, except when it's on the news for stab wounds or for weird viruses. Um, so I'm going to talk about pathology, digital pathology for this talk, because I figured that's probably be closer to what most of you are working in. Um, so digital pathology, or pathology image analysis, actually has quite a long history. So I, I dug up this paper a while ago um, by Judith, Judith Pruitt, who some of you will know for a filter design in, in engineering. And she basically laid out what you need to do digital pathology analysis. So you need some sensor, which will create an image, of course. You need, and she said you need people in the loop, so people to tell you what to go look for. So you presumably use radiologists to help you tell you what to go look for. We need pathologists to help us. And then you need some large general purpose computer to interpret these images and do some learning. And I include this because this is from 1966. Um, so people tend to forget that actually uh, machine learning and medical imaging and things have been around for quite some time. And she was actually dealing with this kind of image here. So, you know, so, uh, so she was able to take some simple features and actually categorize some kinds of white blood cells and so on. So quite a long way away. Um, and then more, so what's kind of revolutionized the field, a little bit of these digital slide scanners. So in the old days, you would have a microscope, you'd have some kind of scanning stage, you would step through it and stitch together some kind of image and it would take forever. These digital slide scanners, I can't quite remember when they came on, on board. Um, I think I got into this field in about 2004 when we still had a home built one at Sunnybrook. Um, but I think around about 2004, 2005, people were starting to build them. They got FDA approved for clinical use, clinical routine use, just in 2018. So they're fairly recent. Uh, and pathology labs are just starting to get them. But research labs have had them for some time. So this has really revolutionized the field because suddenly you can digitize a whole slide image. And I'll show you an example in a minute. This was another key paper in the field. 2011, Andy Beck showed that um, you could extract features. And he was extracting features to try and predict outcome in breast cancer. And he showed that you didn't have to just look at the nuclear, the cancer cells. That if you looked at the stroma and the relationship between the cancer cells and, and the surroundings and the, the environment, you could actually make better predictions. So he was able to predict survival more accurately with this. He was still using small fields of view. He was using something called Definian software, which is a, a sort of image analysis pipeline where you segment your, your cells and color code everything and, and, and then create handcrafted rules. It's very much the old fashioned sort of handcrafted machine learning method. And then um, Yuan, she was in York Warwick, I think when she did this, she showed that if you combined digital pathology images, so if you looked at how many tills, for example, were in your field of view where you took your sample from for doing the genomics assay, and if you combine the imaging data and the genomics data, you can actually improve your classification as well. So this is another big inspiration for me for my work in prediction and prognosis to try and combine information from different sources. Um, so then this was in the old days. So then suddenly deep learning took off. And I just want to show this slide to show you how quickly it all happened. So in 2012, everyone usually knows about Adam Kravetsky, or however you say his name, and, and Jeff Hinton's work, where they smashed the record on image nets. This is where deep convolutional neural networks really hit the ground running, and this is where it all took off. Less people know that Schmidt Huber's lab actually did a paper on convolutional neural networks for nerve segmentation electron microscopy at the same Europe's meeting. So it was, there were two papers in that meeting showing that um, deep convolutional neural networks could really beat other things. And then in the field of digital pathology, there was a very large data set released in about 2016 called Chameleon. These are digitized images of breast lymph nodes with very high detail manual annotations. And this kick-started a lot of the industry interest in this. This is what kick-started people like Google and people looking at digital pathology. This is a very high quality, clinically relevant task where if you solved it, if you really could say there are no cancer cells in these lymph nodes, and that actually would be a useful commercial product. So this kind of kick-started a lot of the industrial excitement in the area. Uh, and then just as a quick plug, we released, um, it's only on archive at the moment, we submitted it to a medical image analysis, but we just did a, a review paper of deep neural networks for computational pathology. Uh, we got 130 papers in that review, and it was a nightmare because we just finished it at Christmas, and every time we thought we'd done, there was another few papers appeared. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a, a complete survey there. So I'm just going to show you what digital pathology image looks like, just to give you some context in case you've not seen them before. So this is when you take a small microscopy slide, you stick it in a scanner, it scans lengthways, 
does all the clever focusing. So at the top, top of this thing here, you can see this is the overview. So this is part of the whole slide image. And this box here represents the field of view you're seeing here, and there's a scale bar here. So these images are very big. I mean, the smallest ones are uncompressed. They're probably a couple of gigabytes. Uh, Martin Yaffe has a whole, whole mount imaging thing where he can digitize scans that big. At 20 times over, his can be 10 or 20 gigabytes big. So we're talking about over 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So these things you tend to analyze by tile by tile. You obviously can't shove the whole thing through any kind of network. And it's a, a difficult problem because, as you see, there's information at every single scale there. So you, you can't just think, oh, I'm going to take a low-res view because you'll miss stuff. Uh, so this is an example here. This is uh, one of the projects I'm doing on ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a non-invasive form of breast cancer. So this is a piece of breast tissue that's been excised at surgery. And this woman has ductal carcinoma in situ, and, and I've helpfully labelled one of them here. But then there are also normal breast ducts. And uh, at this resolution, I, I challenge anyone to figure out which one's which on here. But you need the low resolution to see the context, to see where the ducts are, what the heterogeneity is like, how many of them, and so on and so forth. Um, so here's a couple of different things. So typically, digital pathology images are actually stored in a pyramidal format. You use specialist software to read them. So we, we save whole patches at high resolution at this level of the pyramid and then smaller number of patches here and then some sort of overview here. And like I say, you need information at all scales. So this is a duct here, so you need the low resolution to get the whole duct context. You can see more of the edge here. And you need to go up to the high resolution here to start telling the difference between a, a cancer and a non-cancer. So you need to go all the way down to the cellular image. You need to do mitotic cell counting, or if that's important, you need to go through the higher magnification. Uh, okay, so the work I'm going to talk about here, well, my aim is to do prediction and, and, and um, prognosis with digital pathology. So the, the basic hypothesis is that um, variations in tumor morphology somehow are reflective of under, underlying changes in, in uh, protein expression and, and genetic mutations and so on. So we, there is information in that histology image that can help us to do prediction and prognosis. And if we can characterize this somehow and apply deep learning, then maybe we can add some predictive information. Uh, and the advantage of doing this over genomics is that it provides spatial context, so we get the entire tissue section. We, we don't have to just do these little cores, so I'm, I'm sure the genetics people are trying to get up there. Uh, and we can account much better for tumor heterogeneity. So what I'd like to do is somehow use it in conjunction with. So you use digital pathology, and it's a bit like your thing, the very low probabilities, the very high probabilities of digital pathology were great. You don't need to spend the extra money doing genomics. And then the ones in the middle, maybe you can do a better job of separating those by adding the genetic information and the pathology information together. So that's kind of the aim. Um, so image-based prediction, like I said, there is a good reason to think this histology will give us predictive information because pathologists have been getting that predictive information for hundreds of years with their microscopes. So most people will probably have heard of the Gleason score for prostate. Uh, there's a bunch of different breast scores as well, the Bloom Richardson Nottingham score and, and such like. So these are basically the pathologists have had to over the years figure out, well, this we know patients who have a cancer looks like this have bad outcomes, the ones that don't have like this have good outcomes. So the Gleason grade, for example, looks at how the structure of the glands it gets disorganized uh, during high-grade cancer. So it goes from well-organized glands, sort of uniformly sized, up to more disorganized. And a similar thing in breast cancer. So the, the Nottingham breast score has got something about tubule formation, but it also looks at nuclear pleomorphism and mitotic cell count as well. So these are scoring systems that the pathologists use to try and improve their reproducibility and, and concordance between pathologists. So the first thing in um, machine learning is um, an attempt to sort of recapitulate what the pathologist does. So we know that these things are going to do it. The pathologist can help us by labeling these things. We know what to train on. So this is an example here for breast cancer. I'm working on this sort of thing with uh, the DCIS. So one thing we can try and do is classify pleomorphism. So these are grade one, grade two, and grade three examples of breast cancer. And these are just close-ups. So I, I've got a, there's a graduate student in uh, Bogota with Eduardo Romero who's trying to work on using dictionary-based methods to try and classify those. Um, but uh, more recently, we've gone to data-driven techniques. So the Beck method is much more of a data-driven technique. We've got a bunch of features out from the images. 
threw it into a, a standard machine learning classifier and, and tried to see what came out. That, that has the advantage that you can start to make discoveries, as someone asked earlier. You can start to think about, well, hang on a minute, that stroma was actually the key driver in this prediction here, not the, the cancer cell itself, and so on. So that's very exciting. Um, so radionics, computational pathology, tends to be the handcrafted feature side of things. And then deep learning CNNs are the learning method. Um, so um, I'm going to start off with some supervised learning methods here. So this is where we take a, a labeled whole site image. Uh, like I said, we have to extract patches from these. We can't throw in the whole image. You basically go through a CNN, and you can either do a classification if you've got some sort of binary label or multi-class label. You can actually try and um, do class coordinates. You can do cell segmentation and the like. Uh, and you can do uh, segmentation as well with something called a UNEC that's very commonly used for this particular task. Um, so we started off with a pathology-driven type problem. So residual cancer burden, we know that if you have, if you have an advanced breast cancer or if you know there's going to be a delay in surgery, unfortunately, sometimes what will happen is the woman will have neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery. So if it's a very large tumour, that can shrink it. But even if it's not so large and you think it's more aggressive, it can actually improve outcome if you give chemotherapy before you remove the tumour. And the really good thing about that is you kind of have a test tube situation where you can test out the drug that you give beforehand to find out whether it responds or not. So what you do is when you take the tissue out after surgery, so this is a post-surgical resection of a woman who's had neoadjuvant therapy, you can look to see if any cancer cells are left. And in the old days, you'd look for pathological response but that's a very binary and most women don't but then you lose all the information between well they responded a little bit or they didn't respond at all or they almost completely responded that's all lost so the residual cancer burden tries to quantify how much cancer is left in the tissue it also actually looks at the, the lymph node so we are actually also going to be doing the lymph node thing as well where you try and see whether there's any cancer left in the lymph nodes but this talk won't cover that so the first part of the residual cancer burden seems relatively straightforward. So this area here is where the tumour was. Um, and what, we, what the pathologist does is they kind of look at it, look to see where the cancer cells are as a fraction of the total tumour bed area and expresses that as a percentage. Now it turns out this isn't exactly the same as counting cancer nuclei, looking at the area and divided by the total area, but it's, they have kind of a more of a touchy-feely thing, so you have to kind of calibrate this. So what we did was we have a, a bunch of these with about 95 images or more, and we had pathologists go and mark, so we marked squares on these, and they gave us their estimate of percentage cellularity in each of these squares. They're actually square boxes, not circles, but this looks prettier. Uh, this is on the postdoc slides. Uh, so this, this one here, although it's got lots of nuclei in it, this is actually all perfectly normal. So this is where this task isn't as straightforward as it might appear, because this is zero. Um, whereas it might look like more than that. So this is 15%, 39%, 99%. So, and, and again, this is 99%, although you can see lots of pink in the middle here. So the dark is the, the nuclei. But the, the, as far as the pathologist is concerned, all the stuff around this cytoplasm is all cells. So it's still 100% cellularity. So what we did was we, we took a ton of these. Um, we also, because we started this in the pre-CNN days in my lab, we also were doing this old school. So we also got a bunch of these little patches and asked the pathologist to intricately label every single nuclei visible in patches as being either benign, malignant, or till. So we have a load of those annotations as well. And this data is actually publicly available. I think one of the slides has got a link to where that's available. It's on the TCIA archive. Uh, we made it release. So Shazia Akbar is a postdoc in my lab. So she took over from Mohammed Bukhari, who'd done the sort of old school. So one of my previous PhD students had done this kind of pipeline. So very traditional. You, ex you segment the cells, you extract features, you classify the cells to get a cell map, and then you do a sort of calibration to go from that to the cellularity. So that took him many years because he had to get the cell segmentation right, color segmentation right, and such like, and train the classifier and so on. Shazia came into my lab, we had all the data, I said, well, just try and use an image now on patches. And of course, that took a couple of weeks to sort out, and, you know, uh, just as well. He had got his PhD by then, so he couldn't have <laughs> go away into the corner and hide. Um, so Shazi, what she did was she looked at um, a fairly straightforward image net uh, classifier on this, but she worked out that actually it was better to do this in two halves, so that the classifier does two things. First of all, it checks to see whether it's cancer or not cancer, so we get that classifier, and then she goes on to actually do a regression on, on the, the cancer ones to see what the cellularity is. So she put this out in scientific reports. 
Um, but you can see some of the examples here of patches. So um, the P is actually um, Akari. <laughs> no, actually P is pathologist, H is handcrafted, and D is deep learning. So you can see the deep learning does very well on the, the, the non-cancer. It does much better than the handcrafted features on the non-cancer. Um, it does generally better overall. It, um, yeah, it, it just, just does generally better. And we found out that the concordance between the um, deep learning method um, and the hand engineered method was much better between the pathologist than it was with, with the old hand engineered method. Uh, and, and the advantage of the deep learning method is also that it would take, I mean, Mohammed only ever did it in, in MATLAB, so it took forever anyway. But to, to go over every single patch in the whole slide image and process, extract every single nuclei, get the features, and then do the regression on his and support vector tree, just took days. I mean, it was just completely intractable. Whereas a deep learning network is much faster. You just step over the tiles, generate a probability per tile, so you can get these nice cellularity maps like this, which is much faster and much more useful. You can look at the whole slide context that way. So the dark areas are here, are, are where we think the cancer cells are. Now this is actually, it'd be nice to use this as a cancer detector, but the problem with all these whole slide, I mean, I mean this will work fantastically well on a patch-based task, but as soon as you start assessing on the whole slide images, your false negative rate, a false positive rate goes up through the roof because you're dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of patches. So the level of accuracy you need is really ridiculous on these things. Um, that's a big problem we have. So we, we actually ran a challenge in 2019. We released these patches uh, to the wild. This was a patch-based challenge, so they just had all the patches. I can't remember how many thousands there were. And they just had to do it, and this is uh, one of the concordance indexes. And you can see, actually, that the, the, the people did very well. It's actually quite a straightforward thing to do with the convolution and neural network, so they did very well on that. Um, and actually, the people who won didn't know anything about pathology. Quite scary. Although the, the one who came first actually went out and talked to pathologists, which helped him bump his score a little bit. The same in the chameleon, a bunch of computer scientists did well, but the ones who actually had pathologists talking to them to refine the methods and, and tidy up the edges actually did do better. So domain knowledge still works in this field. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do now with this is um, Eileen Rakovich has been collecting DCIS patients for uh, she has a whole cohort from Ontario over a five-year period. I can't remember what years they were. But we have uh, several thousand patients who we have the uh, whole slide images of, and we know outcome uh, 10, 15 years. So we know whether these women, after they had DCIS removed, whether or not they had an invasive recurrence or a non-invasive recurrence. And the question we're trying to ask is, should they have radiotherapy after surgery? So at the moment, if there's a high risk of recurrence, or they think it's a particularly nasty or DCIS, we should have it as a non-invasive region, they, they may get extra radiotherapy just to make sure, um, but a lot of women won't need it, they'll have no recurrence, the surgery will just take it out, complete cure, no problem. So we're trying to do a, a sort of prognostic prediction on here. So you can see the problem here of course is that a ton of this slide is totally uninformative, this is all fat, some stroma, normal cells. So the first thing we decided to tackle was something more tractable, so we happened to have a database where a pathologist had already labelled the ducts in blue here. The yellows are actually not DCIS, they're something else. So we had a bunch of these, so what we did was just think, well, we'll throw units at it and try and classify it. Uh, but as I showed you before, the, um, the first question is, what scale do you do segmentation on? That's not at all obvious. So I had a, a master's student, Akim Seth, so he looked at low, medium, and high resolution. Uh, and he also tried multi-resolution here. So this is basically, if you go down this arm here and across up here and this here, this is a unit. So your segmentation algorithm, you go down to small feature maps and then you expand up again and then you do these cross linkages across to keep the resolution data handy. So he tried, uh, he tried separate units for the low, medium and high, so he looked at those. But then he also tried this more complicated one where he simultaneously trained the units for all the resolutions together. Uh, and then he also had one where he took the, so each image is a three channel image because you've got red, green and blue. So he basically created a nine channel image where he just sandwiched the low, medium and high together into a nine channel image. So he looked at those. Um, uh, so the nine channel is here. Um, I think 20 times did the worst. So if we use the very high resolution, we got the worst results, possibly because you don't get the context. Uh, when you try and get a pathologist to label an image in digital pathology, 
and you get they do never give the pathologist a patch to label because they will hate you and they'll say, "Oh, I can't do that. It's ridiculous." They 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 work on a microscope by zooming in and out, and they do that continuously. So they're always looking at the context, and then they go into the cell, and they go back out again, and that's very important to them. So we're trying to sort of recapitulate that. Uh, so the high resolution was a bit of a disaster. And it turned out, actually, for the DCIS, because we were looking for structures, it turned out that the um, low resolution network was probably the best. Um, the, um, the nine channel, I think it was the three arm, did OK as well. Um, it did better on some metrics. But then the time comes into a factor. So the low resolution, if you just run one low resolution thing in there, it's done in six seconds for a whole slide, which is really fast. Uh, but if you try and do the uh, multi-channel ones, then it takes a lot longer because if you think about it, you've got to step over that many more tiles. Uh, so this is an example just of the low-res probability map we get out from the unit, and the high-res probability map. So you can see that we didn't bother doing any dithering, so there's some artifacts at the edges of each patch here. So each patch was good enough for time to train. Um, the annotations here, these two annotations here are DCIS by two different so that shows you another big problem we have when we're assessing algorithms is that the ground truth is very flaky and the pathologists always disagree. So it's really hard to get good quality ground truth. This area here is actually not DCIS. So one of the pathologists thought maybe it was DCIS, maybe not. And the other one thought it was Natipia, which is not DCIS. It's something in between. Um, so you can see it, both of these do all right. Ensembles actually do quite well. So if you, take five, if you train five different low resolution units, and then average the probability maps together, you get much nicer results. And that's actually quite a common way of improving deep learning method, is just do an ensemble method. We know that from Randall Forest and other things. The ensemble is always good. Um, so you can see some of the things here, and then it looks quite pretty. So this is a low resolution one, and this is a high resolution one. And then the blue cyan mark is where the pathologist said it was, and then the red is the probability map. So you can see we did a pretty good job here. So the idea here was we wanted to find the DCIS lesions first so that we could actually at least localize where we're looking for doing our prediction maps. Um, so once we've found the DCIS, then again, we're going to do two different approaches. One is we're just going to take patches from the DCIS and the surrounding stroma and then just throw it into some convolutional neural network. The other way we're doing it is we ask the pathologists, well, what, we, what do you think is going to be predicted? The first thing they told us was tumor filtration lymphocytes. We want to know where they are and what, how they're concentrated. And do they go all the way around the duct or they're just part of the duct? So the first thing we did was we took some of those labels that we've made public that on the, uh, each nuclei and we trained a fully convolutional neural network. So this isn't a UNET, but it, it, so it, it just does the convolution, but instead of classifying them as a single digit, it actually does um, an image. Uh, this is actually still, this isn't the whole image that goes in at one time. This is small, I think it's 32 by 32 patch that scans across. So this is still actually quite slow, um, but it's a lot faster than doing traditional methods to try and classify lymphocytes and so on. We did actually get some quite nice things. This was actually a master's student over at Waterloo who wanted to get some data to try this, so we gave him some data to play with. Uh, but then my student now is trying to actually retrain this. He's trying to use that to bootstrap the ground. So he's trying to use that to generate some ground truth, and then he's trying to make a new classifier based on a new net that go much faster because the, the existing one's too slow. You've got to run this on 3,000 whole site images, so we, we need to go faster. Uh, so what we're going to do is we take an H and E image with the area around, and the idea is you get the probability heat map for the lymph lymphocytes. So you can see this has got lots of lymphocytes here and nothing much up here, and so on. And we're going to start then extracting more handcrafted features and try and do this sort of traditional machine learning framework for that. Um, and then other things that we're trying to do as well is nuclear grade. So we will look at grade on there. Uh, what kind of stroma is around the ducts? And is there information in the stroma? So we're going to try and use those as our features for prediction. Um, so this is a, a sort of overview of how you would go about doing sort of weekly supervised learning. So if we try and do a fully convolutional neural network data-driven prediction model on those slides, we have a problem because we have over 100,000 patches in each whole slide image, and we only have one label that says recurrence of tendrils. So that's a really hard problem. Uh, some people have tried doing attention networks with low resolution and they go down. Other people try other things, 
but it's still very difficult. Because if you think about it, you can only fit a small number of your slide patches through the neural network in any one batch. So you have a label that says this is positive, but your batch may not contain a single positive child. So you've basically got the wrong label. So this is where it's really difficult. So weak and supervised methods work quite well in, in the gene. Uh, we know they work quite well in other domains, but in digital pathology, there are particular problems with it. Um, so this is just a schematic from the, the paper, just where we've tried to classify things. So you've got positive instances and negative instances, you put them through. So what you do is you try and get these weak patch labels, so you assume that your whole slide image label is correct, you throw it through. And there's a whole bunch of different aggregation techniques in the literature to so how to do this. Um, and in the, if you're interested in the survey paper, we try and go through some of the different kinds of ways of aggregating this information. So this is one that's been quite popular. Um, this was actually an early archive paper, but the same group published something in. I've noticed that if you're Google and you're a company, you tend to get your papers in Nature Methods quite easily. I think this was actually in Nature Methods or somewhere. This is the final paper. It was on clinical grade. I forgot to change the thing. It's clinical grade AI for digital pathology, I think. Uh, so what they do here is they, they had lots and lots of data. So they basically have the labels on the slide. They throw them in the bag, they, they basically get a probability for each instance, and then they rank the instances, and then they basically retrain based on the most positive and the most negative instances, which is fine if you've got enough data. We've tried it on our DCIS stuff, and it did not work. So we're still struggling to get something going out on there. Uh, and then this is kind of the problem. So part of the problem is this is what they had to play with. Um, which is rather a lot more than what we have to play with, or anyone in this room, I suspect, has to play with. So these DGX1s, uh, 8 V100 cards, so that's 8 times 32 gigs of RAM they have to play with, this is sort of the model if they wanted to, or they can just run thousands and thousands and thousands of epochs through. So I can't remember how many thousands of epochs they used, but it was a lot. The other thing they have is Memorial Sloan Kettering's entire back catalogue. Uh, so this, this thing here, for example, is based on 12,000 whole slide images of prostate cancer. They have a lot of data. So what they show here is the data set size here and the number of slides, and then the validation error here. And they're basically showing that really with this kind of minimum, um, multiple instance learning technique, you need a, a truckload of data. Okay, so that's what they're showing there. Now, we don't have that kind of luxury. Um, so uh, Shazi Akbar, who was in my lab until recently, she was trying another approach. So she was trying to use some representation learning instead. So what she did was she trained an auto, a variation autoencoder, first of all, on un unlabeled patches from all of our data. And then what she does is when she puts through the training patches, so we've got some from positive training images and some from negative training images, she does the weekly, uh, weekly label thing here to get part of the loss function. But then she also uh, maps the patches to something in, in the feature embedding space. And then she clusters that, and then she, she does a majority load on the cluster and adds that to the training loss. So she's basically trying to leverage some untrained data to, to improve the results. That also wasn't great. I mean, this is chameleon data set, so the method kind of works. So this is a close-up of the chameleon data set. So here somebody has intricately labeled where the cancer is in a lymph node. And she was able to get a cost using this null cost function, using a, not using the label here, but using just a whole slide label to say there is cancer in this slide. She was able to get quite good concordance with the segmentation results. So the method works, but it wasn't good enough to get the signal. And this is another problem with this field, is we don't actually know if she can't get a signal. We've got an error with a 0.6, which is pretty, you know, I think you can throw anything in that page and not get a 0.6. Um, but we don't know if that's because we haven't got the right method yet, or we haven't trained it for long enough, or we haven't got the right data, or if there's actually no signal there. Um, so we're not quite sure where, where we're going from there. So there's still work in progress. So future direction, so data sets uh, for clinical problems, especially in digital pathology, are difficult to, ex uh, expensive to obtain. Uh, so until you've got a clinical workflow for digital pathology, you have to slide to scan the slides specially, which actually costs money because uh, someone has to go retrieve them from storage, they have to clean them off, stick them in the scanner, wait for their scan, and then you have to find somewhere to store these wretched things. So it's, it's quite a big deal getting all this data, and then you have to annotate them. And it's not like you can go train a graduate student to do annotation for you. You, you need a pathologist. I, I still can't do the lymph nodes. And the pathologist who's doing the lymph nodes for me still has to go and ask the attending pathologist quite frequently for advice because it's hard. 
So that's one big problem. Uh, so we need, um, so it's not like regulars, we need proper and relevant architecture. So uh, for us, we need to have multi-resolution type architecture. We can hear about the ultrasound, you know, it might not be current on next to ultrasound, for MRI, you have major channel and so on. So we need, we can't just rely on pre-trained image net networks. That's not going to be good for our field. Uh, we need large data sets to pre-train, but we haven't got labels, so we need to have surrogate self-training and that kind of thing. Um, so yes, yeah, so the surrogate tasks are going to be something we need to do in unsupervised methods. Uh, and the trouble with unsupervised methods is they're kind of difficult to evaluate. So unless you've got a downstream task, it's, it's hard to figure out whether you've got a good representation or not. Uh, so this is just a schematic of what kind of unsupervised learning. So most things have sort of an encoder going down to a bottleneck. Uh, the first way we're going to try and do it is see what clusters in there and see whether we can do some clustering in, in the low dimensional space. And you then sort of balance the clustering with the reconstructed whole slide image as a cost function and see if you can train a good encoder that way. But there are other ways of trying to maintain it. So Alex has talked in the past probably here about his painting method for trying to do a self-supervised task. We're trying to find equivalent self-supervised tasks for this kind of problem. And then very quickly, um, I think I've got a few minutes left, uh, I've not spoken off yet. Um, so just a, a quick plug, if you are doing any dish pathology imaging, or even microscopy imaging, actually we've got very large images, um, particularly the whole slide images that's stored in this pyramidal format. It doesn't work very well if you try and use something like image J or like that, or Python, because you keep on having to go from the whole slide to get the context, then you have to extract the patches, and you run your code on the patches, or you label the patches, and then you go back again. So it's very inconvenient. So for this reason, when, when Mike Miaffe at uh, Sunnybrook first started in whole mount imaging, he had the scanning microscopy slide. I remember pitching to the OICR that we needed some software to handle this. So I, I rigged Google Earth that basically went in, zoomed into Sunnybrook, and then went through the pyramidal structure and zoomed in. Well, the so Sedin view is basically Google Earth done properly. <laughs> to hack it. So what it does is it, it lets you zoom in on a whole slide image and it retrieves the tiles at the correct resolution. If you pan, it will retrieve the tiles and so on. And it's the same technology that Pathcore used for their web viewer and so on. So because it's the same stuff underneath, although this is completely free to download, it's fairly well maintained because the code base is the one they use for their commercial product as well. For, for the things like reading different file formats. So we've now got things like um, Z-Stack formats and such like. So we can actually read quite a lot of formats on the software. And the nice thing about it is it's got annotation managers here. You've got er ways that you can trans translate the images and rotate them and so on. Um, so we were funded a while ago by the NIH to try and do plugins to this. So we've got some plugins that can do sort of stain and mixing and stain analysis. Uh, some people from Wake Forest have done an out of focus detector. And there's some registration admin in here that we're working on as well. So just to show you that. So this is a project that Michaela Pop's doing up at Sunnybrook. So she's looking at MRI images and digital pathology images. Uh, she has to manually get the right slice. Um, and at the moment, we do have an automatic method, but it fails so often that Ashback is much easier to do the manual thing. So you can just manually co-register these two images so that they're superimposed. And you can actually show them superimposed on each other with, with opacity. So you can just move it line until it fits. Then you can draw a region of interest on one image and then press a button and it will translate the region of interest to the other, other image in the right location and increase the quantification. So if you are doing some multimodality, it's actually quite a nice tool. Um, it's also very, this is what our pathologists use to do all our annotations, because the annotations just go into XML files. So then we've just got a Python workflow where we take the XML files, we can grab the patches from the right location, and feed them into our deep learning and so on. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of, we haven't actually made this very usable yet. Pathcore are working on a proper Python plugin and an API, so they're trying to go for a RESTful API type thing on there. So they haven't got it yet, but it will be soon. But we did do a proof of concept where we extracted patches from the whole slide. And then outside of Sedin, we threw them through a TensorFlow model that we could say was a, sort of executable. And then what we can do, we can still do, is we can take um, a CSV file where we've got locations and probabilities, or you've actually just got a grid on a CSV file, and we can actually map those as color heat maps. So the nice thing about these heat maps is that looks nice like that, and other software can do that. But we can zoom in all the way to full magnification on that heat map, and it'll still keep the registration. So it's actually much nicer way of looking at, you know, if you think the algorithm's gone wrong, you can look back at the whole slide image, so its original resolution and so on. 
And then finally, a quick plug, if anyone's working on medical image analysis or computer-aided intervention, call for papers is, is open now. This is, conference is it's probably the main, it's certainly the biggest image analysis meeting for, for medical image applications. Where I think the submission date will be set back a little bit. We've just heard from China that none of the Chinese students are getting the reading distance this week. And we've got to go back to early February, so we'll have to adjust some of those deadlines. But yeah, we're taking papers at the moment. So this is quite a nice meeting, and it's in Peru, so if you fancy going somewhere nice, uh, we'll be doing that. And thanks to all the pathologists. So these are the pathologists that have worked with me on various things, and these are the students in my pathology group, so some past students and current students. Thank you.